so here i am so let us start with this interesting subject physiology and i will cover a few uh, interesting uh, disorders which you commonly hit in clinical practice but not all of them of course so physiology and hemodynamics of cardiovascular disorders and their implications in anesthesia uh, uh, as it happens always you know whenever a cardiac patient is going for a non cardiac surgery a lot of hue and cry is created about his pre operative evaluation and fitness and so on but uh, uh, let me tell you i am on the hit list of many surgeons because <laughs> i believe that surgeons are a peculiar species of animals for most of them surgeries are urgent all surgeries are urgent and unavoidable so having said this fundamental clear let us talk about factors deciding choice of anesthesia in a cardiac patient nature and severity of cardiac disorder is the one of course that has to be evaluated what is the quantum of cardiac burden or cardiac morbidity clinical behavior of this disorder in the preceding 8 week that is particularly true for ischemic heart disease patient a patient may have a myocardial infarction in the past and then has been having a stable angina not no major cardiac event in the last 8 weeks is a relatively safe patient for all of us coexisting medical conditions the patient does the patient have renal failure is he a diabetic more than 10 years of diabetes does he have associated copd and so on type and likely likely duration of surgery if it is vascular surgery going to last more than 3 hours you are in trouble you need to take a lot of precautions but if it is just cataract i mean even an unstable cardiac patient can be made fit for cataract surgery so it's it's a it's a delicate balance between the risk of surgery the quantum of cardiac burden against the against the clinical behavior of this disorder in the preceding 6 weeks and as the risk of ga and regional anesthesia in that particular patient let us start with coronary artery disease as we know we have three major epicardial coronary arteries and they determine the myocardial oxygen supply but for you and me rather than anatomy what is important is what are the determinants of myocardial oxygen consumption the first is the heart rate first foremost and the foremost is the heart rate unless your heart rate is well controlled before surgery you you can be assured that you may have lot of perioperative ischemic problems so you see to it that your patient's heart rate is at least 60 before surgery systolic blood pressure derives wall stress and that has to be around 130 to 120 systolic and if those those goals are achieved by your physician cardiologist or yourself approximately 48 hours pre op you will be really safe lv contractility if the ejection fraction is depressed the myocardial oxygen consumption increases because the wall stress increases it is a reverse inverse relation severity of underlying coronary artery disease the more severe coronary artery disease you will have more oxygen demands of the myocardium at even low levels of stress an autonomic tone if the patient has a higher autonomic tone resting tachycardia high systolic bp which are the indices of autonomic tone the demands of the myocardium will be high the control of coronary blood flow is decided by the length of diastole diastole favors subendocardial flow and the systole favors the sub epicardial flow but for you and me to remember that the mean coronary arterial pressure is what determines the coronary flow in systole and diastole both and if it is below 40 mean the subendocardial flow goes low so if you have a protracted hypotension with a mean bp of less than 40 during surgery you will you will expect this patient to have a perioperative ischemia and the subepicardial flow has a little, little lesser cut off that doesn't go low so soon when the mean pressure goes below 25 there is some degree of coronary auto regulation which is endothelium dependent and resistance vessels dilate progressively as the mean pressure falls but again this is not so true in diabetics in stage renal disease and patients who have two or more vascular risk factors for more than a decade i repeat again diabetics in stage renal disease and two or more vascular risk factors for more than a decade in them the endothelium dependent auto regulation of coronary flow is is not at its best is far too suboptimal and here you need to take care factors that lead to myocardial ischemia intra or post operatively are tachycardia number 2 absence of beta blocker use pre operatively severe hypotension mean bp lasting less than mean bp of less than 40 lasting more than 30 minutes in trop aortic cross clamping and the duration of cross clamping during vascular surgery severe blood loss even without hypotension supraventricular arrhythmia and uncontrolled vent with uncontrolled ventricular rate during surgery a lot of people come out and tell in the you know in the in the emergency room or sorry in the icu no we had a blood loss but patient never had hypotension 
so that is very important severe blood loss even without hypertension can precipitate myocardial ischemia fatal myocardial infarctions usually occur in patients with critical fixed stenosis but one third of myocardial infarctions do occur in patients with non obstructive coronary plaques in fact there was a beautiful study published in the british journal of anesthesia just last month jan which said that as many as 11% of the perioperative myocardial infarctions occur in patients who have minor 20%, 30% and 40% plaque. They had an angiogram 5th day or 7th day after the surgery and had, were shown to have minor plaque disease. So what happened actually? The plaque ruptured. The plaque ruptured and became vulnerable. So there are three types of syndrome as we know. ST elevation myocardial infarction, ST depression and T wave inversion what is called non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. And the definition of syndrome goes by the ECG. If you have no ST elevation and the cardiac markers are negative, it is called unstable angina. And if you have no ST elevation but the cardiac markers are positive, it is called non-ST elevation myocardial infarction or it is called NSTEMI. NSTEMI, standard term now well established in literature. And on the other side you have ST elevation MI which is far more dangerous far more uh, uh, far more worse to handle in the perioperative period than a non ST elevation MI when plaque rupture occurs plaque rupture occurs there occurs a non occlusive thrombus which leads to non ST elevation MI and if the occlusive thrombus you have ST elevation MI so if the thrombus occludes the artery completely you get ST elevation myocardial infarction if you see the anatomy of the atherosclerotic plaque you have a lipid rich core there this lipid rich core and if the lipid rich core is big you have a plaque which is unstable as against if you have a lipid rich core which is small with a thick fibrous cap then you have a stable plaque a relatively stable plaque now there is no way to know this preoperatively isn't it there is absolutely no way to know but we must know what are the clinical predictors of a stable plaque versus unstable and the only single clinical predictor is the behavior of the patient's symptoms in the preceding eight weeks before he has landed up with you. If the patient says, doctor, seven days back I had a meal and post meal I had a heaviness, he has an unstable plaque. If he says that until three months ago I used to take two rounds of Shivaji Park, but now last seven days doctor, half a round and I am panting, my neck chokes, I have heaviness in the arms, here is an unstable patient. He cannot be taken for a non-cardiac elective surgery. If it is an emergency non-cardiac surgery, you have no choice. But elective surgery, you will have to wait and evaluate the patient. What are the detect? How do you detect perioperative ischemia? Is number one ECG changes. Number two, if the patient has unexplained hypotension, think about ischemia. Unexplained hypotension. Many times we have been called in the ICU. You know, patient has hypotension, and even an ECG is not taken. That's not done. So if you have unexplained hypotension or dyspnea, it can be ischemia. If your patient has an ill-sustained ventricular tachycardia or a complex ventricular ectopy, polymorphic VT, short runs, ill-sustained VT, short runs, couplets and triplets coming far too frequently than can be explained by the hemodynamic changes in the patient or the erythroid imbalance in the patient, then of course ischemia should be suspected. And of course troponin T cutoff limit is 0.6 and increase in the CP can be more than two times the upper limit of normal. Now, there are clinical predictors, this we, of course, all of you all know this, which can predict increased cardiovascular risk of MI, death and heart failure in the post-operative period. The major predictors are unstable angina, recent MI within the last month or so, decompensated heart failure, significant arrhythmias and severe valvular disease. Now, if you carry this and all my residents do carry this in a short uh, laminated card here, which are the major predictors of cardiovascular risk. Then there are intermediate predictors of cardiovascular risk, mild angina, prior myocardial infarction, prior decompensated heart failure, prior, sorry, prior or compensated heart failure, insulin dependent diabetic. Please remember, insulin dependent diabetics, uh, normally when we say, we, we immediately think about starting juvenile diabetes. No. They are the maturity onset diabetes, but who are on insulin? Who are, I'm, I mean by that, these are the people who almost equal, they are, their risk is equal to the patient who has already suffered a myocardial infarction. This is very, very important statement I'm making that if you have an insulin dependent maturity onset diabetic, please 
प्लीज कनोट इन योर ब्रेन दैट ही ऑलरेडी हैज हैड वन एम आई हिज रिस्क इक्वल्स टू अ नॉन डायबिटिक पर्सन हु ऑलरेडी हैड वन माइकार्डल इन्फेक्शन एन स्टेज रीनल डिजीज माइनर प्रेडिटर्स आर एज मोर देन सिक्सटी फाइव एबनॉर्मल रेस्टिंग ई सी जी एस टी सेगमेंट चेंजेस रिदम विच इज एनी अदर रिदम अदर देन साइनस इफ यू हैव ए एफ इफ यू हैव नोडल रिदम इफ यू हैव इंटरमीडियंट जंक्शनल एस्केप रिदम एनी अदर रिदम अदर देन साइनस इज अ माइनर रिस्क क्राइटेरिया लो फंक्शनल कैपेसिटी दैट मीन्स इफ पेशेंट सेज इज प्रैक्टिकली सीडेंटरी पेशेंट बेयरली एवर गोइंग आउट ऑफ द हाउस एंड यू कैनॉट इवेल्युएट इज फंक्शनल कैपेसिटी ही इज अ पेशेंट हु इंक्लूडेड इन टू द माइनर रिस्क क्राइटेरिया हिस्ट्री ऑफ स्ट्रोक एंड अनकंट्रोल्ड हाइपर टेंशन अनकंट्रोल मीनिंग द ब्लड प्रेशर मोर देन वन सिक्स जीरो बाय नाइन जीरो डिस्पाइट वॉट एवर ड्रग्स द पेशेंट इज टेकिंग द ऑप्टिमल ब्लड प्रेशर फॉर एनी नॉन कार्डियक मेजर सर्जरी आई रिपीट एनी नॉन कार्डियक मेजर सर्जरी और इंटरमीडिएट रिस्क सर्जरी इज वन फोर्टी नाइनटी कट ऑफ लिमिट फॉर माइनर सर्जरीज यू कैन एक्सेप्ट अ कट ऑफ ऑफ वन सिक्सटी बाय नाइनटी एनीथिंग अबाउ दैट नीड्स अ बेटर कंट्रोल प्री ऑपरेटिवली एंड दिस इज अ सिंपल वे ऑफ आस्किंग योर पेशेंट वॉट इज इज फंक्शनल कैपेसिटी यू नो कैन यू टेक अप केयर ऑफ योर सेल्फ दैट इज वन मेट दैट इज ईट ड्रेस और यूज द टॉयलेट वॉक इंदोर्स इन साइड द हाउस If you can walk a block or two on a level ground at around two or three miles an hour, which is like a leisurely walk, it is around three mets. If you can do light work around the house, like washing dishes, it is around three and a half mets, and that is how it goes: four mets on climb a flight of stairs or walk up a hill, do a heavy work around the house, like scrubbing floors, lifting, moving heavy furniture, etc., etc. That is around six mets. More uh, down the down the line, if you go seven, eight, and ten mets. what i'm saying is every patient coming to you may not have a stress test done isn't it they don't have a stress test with them in fact 90% of them so what what level of functional capacity do you judge you just ask this simple very very simple straight forward questions and you will know any functional capacity of seven metabolic equivalents and above is a safe relatively safe patient because he will stand the stress of surgery because even intermediate risk surgeries do not produce a metabolic stress of more than seven mets only vascular surgeries neuro surgeries major cardiac surgeries abdominal aortic aneurysms bilateral tkr or thr these are the kind of surgeries which produce a stress or metabolic stress of something like 8 8 and a half mets so if you if you have a patient who can do 7 mets approximately our safe patient and then there are high risk surgeries intermediate risk and low so these are the procedures which are called high risk intermediate risk and low risk procedures which all i'm sure all of you have these charts with you all the time so that you can equate the risk of a patient on one side and the risk of the surgery which is going to go through on the other side and you have to balance this there are some tests which improve the identification of definition of cardiovascular disorder